So, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the K4 session uh, in this uh, morning in Europe and afternoon in, in Australia. It is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Geoffrey Goodhill. Uh, uh, he leads a lab that is interested in how brain processes information, particularly during development. Uh, their studies include how growing nerve fiber use molecular cues to make guidance decisions, or how to visual input form in the optic tectum and in the visual cortex, and how they code sensory information. He has a very large team of people from diverse disciplines, including biology, mathematics, physics, computer science, and they use the combination of mathematical, experimental, and computer techniques. Professor Goodhill originally trained in mathematics, physics, artificial intelligence, and cognitive science in the UK, but then spent 10 years uh, at the United States as professor in Georgetown University in Washington. In 2005, he, he moved to University of Queensland in Australia. He has published over 100 papers in uh, very diverse and prestigious journals, including Nature Neuroscience, Neuro PNAS, and others. In 2014, he received the Paxinos Watson Prize from the Austra Australasian Neuroscience Society for a paper in neuron. He has been awarded with several uh, Australian Research Council Discovery Project and National Health and Medical Research Council Project, a Simon Foundation grant as chief investigator, and a number of different uh, national and international grants as PI. He has trained over 30 PhD and postdoc students many of whom are now faculty members in universities worldwide or working in tech companies as Google DeepMind. From 2005 to 2010, he was uh, editor-in-chief of the journal Network Computation in Neural System, and he's currently on the board of Neural Computation, Brain Informatic, and Scientific Report. In 2006, he founded the Australian Workshop on Computational Neuroscience, and in 2015, the System and Computational Neuroscience Down Sander Conference. During his career, he taught courses in medical neuroscience, development neuroscience, mathematical neuroscience, and scientific computing. And he did, or he does, a lot of outreach activity, including uh, radio interviews and public lectures, and has also written several articles for the conversation and given a talk in TODEX. So, Josh, thank you very much for being here, and, and the stage is for you. Thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction and um, welcome all and uh, thank you for joining joining us and I know it's uh, not the most friendly time in some parts of the world but I, I really appreciate it and um, so thank you to the organizers for putting on this great great conference you know they had to run around and do a lot of lot of work to make it happen and I really appreciate that and thank you very much for the invitation so let me start um, sharing my screen so um, I'm currently at the Queensland Brain Institute and School of Mathematics, Mathematics and Physics at um, in Australia in the University of Queensland. However, I just wanted to mention that um, next year I'll be moving to Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, uh, where I'll be in uh, neuroscience, developmental biology, and biomedical engineering. And there will be several um, positions available there. Um, so if anybody is interested um, in that, please um, get in touch. So. This is a movie of a developing um, uh, zebrafish, not from uh, not from the, the references there. So one of the things that really fascinates me about the brain is how it's built from scratch. So it has to form all the right connections, all the right kinds of neural codes, and often it has to do this while at the same time interacting with the world and avoiding um, predators and catching prey. So. Despite recent advances in AI, um, I mean, very impressive advances as, as Matt Bopinick, um, um reviewed, we're still nowhere close to uh, designing a machine that can actually build itself. So not just adjusting the strengths of um, some, some synapses in a, in a fixed architecture, but actually constructing the whole hardware from, 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 from scratch into a, a functional system which can interact intelligently with the world. And I think if we were able to do that, um, understand the computational principles involved in doing that, that could be an important step forward for artificial intelligence. It's also the case um, that many disorders of the human nervous system are disorders of neural development. So for instance, autism and schizophrenia um, are believed to arise from basically problems with wiring during neural, neural development. So that's another important reason to try to understand what, um, um, how, nor how normal development occurs and sorry um what could go um what can go wrong with that so so i'm just going to go to my other computer here and pull up a picture where you can see what i can see 
Okay, good. Uh, okay, so we did that. Okay. Um, so, sorry, could you just tell me what you're seeing now? It's a zebra fish hunting a prey. Okay. Okay. This is weird on my computer over here. I'm still seeing my title slide, but anyway. Okay. So as long as it, um, that's good. So um, the model system we're focusing on, particularly at the moment, is the zebrafish. So you saw that beautiful movie just now um, of how in um, 72 hours it develops from a single cell to a, a whole functioning organism. And so now this is a movie from uh, my lab showing that shortly after that, at, at, um, by around five days post-fertilization, so five days since being a single cell, the fish is able to um, um, chase after these fast-moving prey, paramecia, and catch them. And it does this using visual cues. And so it um, sort of locks onto the target and then a series of uh, correcting movements and eventually lunges at the prey and, and hopefully catches it. As you can see, this one's uh, struggling a bit, but uh, makes it makes it in the end. So this really is, I think, you know, just very impressive, a very impressive feat of neural development, how you can build a whole functioning um, um, nervous system uh, to control um, a, a, a growing body to perform these um, quite remarkable um, you know, visual motor integration. Okay, so to do that, you have to form lots of connections. And so this is from a, uh, a lovely recent paper by Herbig Byers Group, um, published in Neuron. And so this is a movie of um, their painstaking reconstructions of a large number of connections in the um, nervous system of the larval zebrafish. And we'll see um, a number of reasons why the zebrafish is a, is a great system to study for development. And so here they use a genetic technology which labeled um, individual neurons and they could trace the um, tracer connections. Now, um, once um, connections have been formed, the animal has to form the right patterns of um, um, activity. And so, okay. What are you seeing now? Oh, okay. Formation of the neuronal connections. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is a movie um, from from my lab showing a larval zebrafish brain where the neurons have been labelled with GCAMP six and um, obviously false coloured. But what we're looking at here is light sheet imaging of the. Uh, more or less the entire brain of the larval zebrafish. And um, this, here we have spontaneous activity. Um, and we can record of the order of 100,000 neurons at once using this technology. And so um, what's special here is that the larval zebrafish is basically transparent. So without any intervention at all, with no um, dissection at all, you can just stick this fish under the microscope, immobilize it, stick it under the microscope, and record activity of very, very large numbers of uh, neurons simultaneously. Okay, so here's some of our early work looking at the um, growth of axons across the zebrafish tectum. And so in this movie, we're looking at uh, an individual retinal ganglion cell axon and a few hours of its movement across um, the optic tectum, trying to form a, um, a topographic map. And you can see that there's a huge amount of activity in this, this axon. So it's branching, um, the growth cones at the tip of the um, uh, branches are clearly searching for uh, the right kind of place to um, stop and, and make, make synapses. And so, um, again, this is due to the genetic tractability and the um, transparency of the zebrafish that were able to um, do these kinds of experiments. So, of course, axon guidance in vivo is a very, very interesting question, but um, hard to, you know, the, the environment is relatively uncontrolled. So we have focused a lot on looking at um, axon guidance in vitro. So the aim here is to try and understand what are the cues axons are using to um, be guided, or more particularly, well, we know they, they're using um, a variety of molecular cues, but exactly how they're using those cues and how they're detecting those cues.
So here we see this is actually a rat, um, um, a rat neuron, rat dorsal root ganglion neuron, which is growing across the um, surface of a culture dish. So here there's there's no particular cues in its environment. That's just um, uh, the pattern of the um, um, the glass on the bottom of the dish, um, and um, the, the but the growth cone sort of searching around trying to find where uh, where it would like to go, and. One of the most important cues axons use to uh, find their targets is actually molecular gradients. So this is actually a little bit like the um, uh, the schematic situation that um, Daniel Polani showed in his talk, where here we have a um, a gradient of a um, a growth factor which is being released from this pipette tip here. You can't see it, but it's diffusing out and creating a gradient by diffusion. And um, the tip of this this rat axon here is detecting that gradient and um, moving up the gradient. So this is about one hour of real time. And so one of the questions we'd be very interested in is trying to understand how is it that a small sensing device like this is able to de detect a relatively shallow chemical gradient. So the in this assay, you can determine that the change in concentration across the width of the growth cone here is about 10%, um, 10% fractional change. And so that's a that's a relatively um, shallow gradient. It's still, we think that um, the gradients present in vivo that axons are responding to must be um, actually shallower than that, because if you ha maintain, have to maintain a 10% gradient over 10 microns, then you rapidly uh, run out of um, uh, concentration range. So I'll show you later evidence that um, axons can only respond over about a hundredfold change in concentration, and um, you run out of that um, that uh, range of concentration at a ten percent change over over ten microns, at a distance of about half a millimeter. Okay, so what is it that's constraining the ability of a small sensing light? device like this to detect a gradient? Well, there are some very fundamental physical constraints, uh, in particular three of them. So this is a, a schematic of this, the um, uh, a cell membrane here. So it has some receptors, you have some ligand molecules which are diffusing, and then you have some downstream signaling molecules. So firstly, there are thermal fluctuations in the number of ligand molecules. So every time you measure the number of molecules, even if you perfectly measure the number of molecules in a, in a particular volume, that number of molecules is going to be changing um, all the time as molecules diffuse in and out of that volume. Secondly, there are stochastic fluctuations in receptor binding. And so these molecules are binding um, um, stochastically to these receptors. So the probability of receptor is bound, is determined by the external concentration, but the molecules are constantly popping on and off these receptors. So every time um, you look at these receptors, you'll, you'll see a different pattern of binding. And then these receptors are signaling via these downstream signaling molecules. And these are subject to the same kind of fluctuations as the external um, ligand molecules. And so one, one project that um, um, we've contributed to is understanding what are the fundamental physical limits um, to the ability of a, um, a system like this to determine external concentration. So we built on some beautiful earlier work. Oh, sorry, and thermal fluctuations here. So we built on some beautiful earlier work by um, Bergen Purcell, a very classic paper in 1977. I really encourage you to, to read it, beautiful um, um, sort of calculations of what the, um, the, the limits to the system are. So that work was uh, pursued further by uh, Bialik and Sadiashka in, in, in 2005, where they took a more rigorous approach uh, based on the fluctuation dissipation theorem in statistical physics um, to um, sort of firm up our understanding of those limits. Now, one of the interesting things is um, that the focus in these papers was mostly on sensing in three dimensions. And so he, you have you have the ligand molecules that are diffusing in three dimensions. However, in many cases in the development of the nervous system, the system is actually more two dimensional. So, for instance, for those um, for those axons growing across the surface of the zebrafish tectum, which I showed you, the, um, the, the 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 cues in the environment that the axons are detecting are essentially bound to cell membranes that they're growing across. And so that's essentially two dimensional environment. And 
diffusion in two dimensions works fundamentally differently from diffusion in three dimensions. And if you sort of naively try to apply the approach from these papers, you, um, you get integrals that um, uh, diverge in two dimensions. And so this remained a bit of a problem for, for a while. Um, and the problem was solved by my um, student, Brendan Bicknell, um, in a collaboration with Peter Dayan. So Brendan is now a postdoc with Michael Hauser in London. And what Brendan did was recognize that, um, actually in the biological case, um, the molecules are actually spatially confined. They're not diffusing in an infinite volume. So if they're diffusing on the surface of a cell, that's a, that's a, finite, um, a finite domain. And so he showed that that actually allows you to um, solve this two-dimensional case. And in fact, he went further and um, derived a general solution which applies to any number of dimensions. And from that, um, he was able to derive the limits in one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. And so this is the fractional um, uncertainty in your concentration estimate. And this is the um, receptor um, uncertainty term, and this is the ligand uncertainty term. And so the, the 1D case and the 3D case have been derived previously, and, 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 and these match with those. And uh, uh, Brendan's contribution was this uh, two-dimensional case here, where you see this nice dependence on the domain, domain radius here, which in three dimensions um, for a finite domain scales as the square root. Here you have the log of um, the square root, and here you have no dependence on the, um, on the radius. So from a practical point of view, um, so that enabled us to show, for instance, that um, some recent claims that um, retinal axons would have to average for hours to re um, obtain a reliable concentration measurement um, probably is not, not right. And in fact, um, using these calculations, you could make a quite a, an accurate estimate in, 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 in just a couple of minutes. Okay. So that doesn't tell us, those calculations tell us about fundamental physical limits, but they don't tell us how the um, axon is actually detecting things. That is what would be the optimal um, uh, computation that a small sensing device like this would do. So going back to um, this case here, this was addressed by my student Duncan Mortimer, and he considered a, um, a growth cone uh, an idealized growth cone with a one-dimensional array of receptors, and the receptors are binding and un unbinding ligand molecules to the environment. There's some gradient, and we'd like to decide, based on the pattern of receptor binding, is it more likely that the gradient points to the right or to points to the left? Now, it's important to understand that um, both of these possibilities, uh, but both of these are possible given any particular pattern of binding. It's only their probabilities that depend on the pattern of binding. So, if the growth cone was being really smart, then it would be thinking about um, the Reverend Thomas Bayes and um, would use um, that statistical approach to determine what is the um, optimal decision about gradient direction. And in particular, um, it will compare the probability that the gradient points left, given the pattern of binding, with the probability that gradient points right, given the pattern of binding. Now, since we know quite a lot about the biophysics of um, receptor binding, um, Duncan was able to do an analytical calculation for um, the proportion of times you'd expect the growth cone to make a correct decision. So this is the probability of making the correct decision given the external concentration gamma and the concentration steepness mu. So that's um, you know, a chance, half plus um, a scaling factor where n is the number of receptors times this um, a uh, linear dependence on the gradient steepness. This is assuming shallow gradients and this interesting nonlinear dependence on the absolute concentration gamma. Okay, so this is a theoretical prediction. And so we wanted to see if this was true in reality. And for various reasons, this assay here uh, is not terribly suitable for um, um, testing predictions like this. So um, we built a new assay now, I'm actually um, mixing up the historical timeline here. This is an assay we've been working on before, before that, but um, there was a nice convergence between the results of this assay and the results of the theoretical modeling. So um, in this assay, we, what we wanted to do is create controlled gradients in a three-dimensional collagen gel environment, which is much more like the environment the axons are growing in in vivo than the assay I was just showing you. 
and um, we wanted to create a gradient in the collagen which would remain stable for periods of days, which is the time scale over which um, axons are finding their targets in vivo. And so we did that by printing, um, using this, this setup to print um, lines of changing concentration of the factor. In this case, we use nerve growth factor onto the surface of the collagen. Those uh, lines diffused in, um, um, the gaps between them filled in quickly, but because diffusion scales as distance squared, the um, gradient over this distance takes a long time to flatten out. So we have this long period of the order of a day or two where we have a relatively stable gradient in the gel and we can look at the response of axons to those gradients. So I'm going to skip over a lot of the technical details of the experiment there and just show you some of the results. So this is the prediction from the, um, um, from the equation I just showed you. So this is looking at uh, four different steepnesses, and this is looking at how that changes the concentration. So this is this, um, 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 so this shows that, that, that gamma variation in the formula before. And so we tested lots of different combinations of gradient steepness and um, concentration, and the experimental results look like, uh, look like this. And so um, you can see that um, Roughly speaking, they, they match pretty well with the um, theoretical prediction. So there's an increase in the, um, so this is just a measure of the chemotactic response. So there's an increase in the, in the response as the gradient steepness increases. And there's this rapid decline in the um, sensitivity. So zero here means no uh, chemotactic response. And there's a rapid decline in the sensitivity as you move away from this optimal concentration, which is around about the dissociation constant for the receptor ligand interaction. Now, so that was a very nice uh, match between um, between theory and experiment here, and there's 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 uh, uh, almost no parameters in this um, in this theory here, um, and the, but the take home message from a biological point of view is that you can only get a reliable response over a narrow range of concentration. And so this is only about two orders of magnitude in concentration. So it means that concentrations in vivo have to be very tightly controlled um, in order for axons to be effectively guided by gradients. And in particular, um, given um, that they require a particular steepness, um, um, that limits, you know, that, that this concentration range limits the total distance over which axons can be guided. Okay, and so so my student Brendan recently uh, developed um, um, another version of a model um, to look in more detail at these curves if you're interested. Okay, so those constraints uh, led me to speculate in an article in Trends in Neuroscience um, uh, a few years ago about whether molecular gradients really are uh, the end of the story about how the brain becomes wired up. I mean, certainly um, it appears there are some molecular gradients in the brain, in the brain, and if you knock them out, that interferes with axon guidance. But um, based on the um, um, the quantitative requirements for axons to be guided reliably by gradients, I think there's probably um, other things that have to be going on besides molecular gradients. Okay, so up to now we've been talking about how axons detect gradients, but not how they interpret them. So in this experiment, um, we're reproducing some work um, that. So a, a very interesting finding from Moomin Poo and colleagues. And they found that you can actually switch attraction to repulsion by varying levels of calcium in the growth cone and varying levels of um, cyclic nucleotides in the growth cone. So what's happening in this assay, this is exactly the same assay I just showed you, except all we've done is we've lowered the levels of cyclic AMP in the medium here and therefore in the growth cone. And in this case, the norm, normal attraction of the growth cone gets switched to um, repulsion. So we're interested in trying to understand that quantita quantitatively. So this was the work of uh, my student, uh, Libby Forbes, um, amazingly talented student. She was actually an undergrad in the lab when she did this work. Um, prior to this, she'd already won um, uh, a Brains for Brains Award uh, based on a, a, a previous paper she published from her undergraduate work in, in, in my lab. So a really astonishing um, achievement. She's now training to be a pediatric immunologist. Um, so the model we... Um, um, uh, came up with was was based on ideas from the literature. This this particular um, signaling cascade is very important for determining attraction versus repulsion. So the external ligand um, gradient produces differential levels of calcium inside the growth cone. Um, they feed into. I won't go through the details of this this network, but 
Um, this network is actually very similar to um, one that's believed to determine the switch between long-term potentiation and long-term depression. And so we were able to borrow some theoretical ideas from uh, a nice paper by Grabner and Brunel. Um, and um, we imagine there were two copies of this um, signal transduction network and one on the left side of the growth cone and one on the right side of the growth cone. So they took different levels of calcium in and the output is levels of CAM kinase to relative to calcium urine and how that ratio varies between the two sides of the growth cone. So from that model, so I won't go through all the equations, but from that model, we were able to make predictions about whether you'd get uh, traction or repulsion depending on levels of calcium and levels of the cyclic AMP. And so this just shows a schematic representation of um, the quantitative outputs of the model there. And um, so this reproduced all the known findings about um, how levels of cyclic AMP and, and calcium um, affect attraction versus repulsion, and also made some novel predictions, which we tested experimentally and found they were, uh, found they were correct. Um, and so there's a, a, a whimsical uh, cover from um, uh, a review article about this in, in trends in uh, neurosciences. Okay, so to wrap up my discussion um, for the first part of the talk about axon guidance, I just wanna talk about um, um, digging deeper into the uh, regulation of calcium levels. So we saw um, that these are very important for controlling axon guidance. And so here we, um, we're interested in, so this is, I'm going to show you some work in the moment from, from, from Brendan, more work from Brendan Bicknell in the lab. And um, he got very interested in the role of the IP3 receptor in controlling um, um, the release of calcium from the endoplas endoplasmic reticulum here. So, so um, calcium comes in um, through, you know, through the cell membrane, but it's also um, then um, produces more calcium. Um, so this binds calcium and IP3, and then more calcium is released from endoplasmic reticulum. And that's very important for these for these guidance events. Now, in looking closer at the IP3 receptor, um, Brennan um, noticed um, some interesting results in the literature about a phenomenon called uh, modal gating. And so in modal gating, what happens is that a um, um, you have a receptor and it's long term, you know, if you average over the long term, its probability of being banned is just determined by the external concentration. But on a shorter temporal scale, the um, receptor uh, goes through phases where um, it's mostly closed here, it's mostly open here, or um, it sort of bounces in between. And so this phenomenon of modal gating is not you know, it was not well understood in terms of how that can arise from individual subunit kinetics. So uh, Brendan adapted an approach um, first introduced by DeYoung and Kaiser um, um, for modeling uh, receptor activity in terms of individual subunit Markov chains. And so this sort of extended this DeYoung Kaiser approach to look at um, um, the the way an individual receptor bounces between different states. So here, four is the active state. So it needs to be in state four in order for the um, channel to be open. And you have four of these um, subunits. Um, but it can also bounce through these a number of um, these internal states. And um, so Brendan came up with this model where you were able to um, um, assume that it was bouncing through this, this set of internal states. And by adjusting the parameters of the, adjusting these rate constants here, you were able to quantitatively produce the, um, um, the modal gating that's seen um, experimentally. So, um, so here you're, you know, based on the idea of uh, four independent subunits, each going through this, um, um, you know, through this series of states, you can reproduce the phenomenology of modal gating here. Okay. So, let me just check how we're doing for time. And uh, let me just go back here. Okay. So and then the second part of the talk, I want to talk about our uh, more recent work on um, the development of neural coding and behavior in the zebrafish. So this here is an image of a zebrafish labeled with um, GCAMP6 in its neurons. Okay. So 
we've got quite interested in behavior. As you can see, they start performing these interesting um, um, hunting behaviors from a very early age. And of course, the first thing you need to do to study that quantitatively is to be able to um, uh, reliably track the fish. And this was a project uh, taken on by, by postdoc Michael McCulloch. And so this is an output of um, a program of his where we have the fish hunting the paramecium. And this is a series of hunting events stitched together. And this is slowed down a lot now. And so you can see this is using a variety of um, uh, classical image processing, processing techniques, um, tracking positions along the tail and the um, position the, the midpoint between the eyes and is also tracking the paramecia and uh, so we know um, um, the distance and angle from the paramecia of, of the fish at each time and the angle uh, the, the position of the tail at each time and from that we can do a lot of um, quantitative analysis of the properties of these this hunting behavior so now i'd like to show you some results from um, a paper that's um, due out in a, in a couple of days in uh, current biology and this is a project that was overall led by my um, postdoc at the time the like habitan so the like has now moved to the hebrew university in uh, jerusalem where she's um, started uh, her own lab she's also looking for uh, people if you uh, fancy moving to jerusalem um, so um, in this so here we're looking at how this hunting behavior changes over development. So there's been a lot of nice studied studies recently um, about how um, um, looking quantitatively at the zebrafish hunting behavior. But what we've done is look at this from a developmental perspective and track how this hunting behavior changes over the first um, couple of weeks of the um, life of the zebrafish. So this is looking at a number of metrics of hunting behavior. So this is the duration of each bout, uh, sorry, of each hunting event. Uh, the number of bouts, um, these discrete swimming events, um, required in um, in each hunting event, um, and you can see those are declining over this period, um, this early period of development. So the hit ratio here is the proportion of um, times the fish goes after some prey and actually manages to catch it, and so that improves over development. And so this. These three graphs are using um, different fish at each age. This is using the same fish at five days and 13 days and showing even for the same fish, there's an increase. Um, for all of these fish, there was an increase in um, their hit ratio. So the fish are clearly getting uh, better at hunting during development. Um, that's perhaps um, no surprise, but um, we wanted to look at um, what might be going on in the brain that um, um, is, is correlated with those improvements in hunting. Another interesting aspect of the hunting is this change in the post-bout angle. So the fish first detects the paramecia at a range of angles between about 0 and 90 degrees. And then it does an, its first bout is an orienting movement to line up uh, more with the paramecium. But interestingly, it undershoots that. So um, this is, shows the post-bout post angle relative to the paramecium. So if it lined up perfectly the paramecium, it will be flat but it's consistently um, at an angle like this. And so that means it's, it's unshooting, not moving all the way. Um, and that, so we think it's probably doing that deliberately. So this has been discussed in a number of um, other interesting papers, for instance, from um, Florian Engert's lab. Um, but what we showed is this, this undershoot actually changes during development. So at 15 days, um, this undershoot is much smaller than at five days. And so that suggests that this undershoot uh, while it may be uh, deliberate, it's also something that's getting smaller over development. And so explanations of the undershoot, um, which say why it should be a certain angle, um, you know, need to take account of this, the fact that this, under, this, this, this angle is changing over development. Um, and in another new direction, we've also started looking at the, um, the fluid dynamics constraints on the zebrafish um, at this age. So this is work of um, student Thomas Darbaniza in the lab. And so he's at, uh, use this um, nice um, um, software, this um, immersed boundary method adaptive mesh refinement or IBAMA um, software that you can download. And uh, we've actually put real uh, movements of the fish determined from our tracking code into this simulation. And from that, we're able to um, actually do you know, full three-dimensional fluid dynamic simulations showing, um, looking at here, for instance, the velocity field of the fluid around the fish. So this is moving um, the sort of Reynolds number, if you're familiar with that, the Reynolds number here is of the order of 100. So it's an interesting sort of intermediate Reynolds number regime. And so we're looking at how these fluid dynamical constraints change as the fish increases in size and whether that may affect its um, choice of about strategy.
So this is still a work in progress, but I'll show you some preliminary results, which are that um, two metrics of the sort of efficiency of the movement, the stroll number and the cost of transport, are both decreasing over, over development here. So um, um, the fish are certainly becoming more efficient in terms of their interactions with the fluid environment over development. So um, we're currently writing up a paper on that at the moment. Okay, so now to get to um, the thing that uh, probably most excites you about um, uh, zebrafish, um, which is that it's possible to image, um, because of its transparency, it's possible to image very large numbers of neurons in its brain uh, simultaneously without any kind of um, uh, intervention. So this is showing two photon uh, imaging. Uh, this is of the order of 10,000 neurons here. And um, so this is just spontaneous activity in a fish. So it's embedded in agarose under a two photon microscope. And this is, um, here we've scanned seven planes at a volume imaging rate of about one second. So we're capturing the activity of about 10,000 neurons um, um, every second. And so we can do some very interesting kinds of analysis of the um, large scale structure of neural activity, but, but, but analyzed at single neuron resolution. So, We've just started on that. And so the results I want to show you are mostly from a slightly more focused, um, so let me just go back here, slightly more focused. Um, oh, I keep skipping over this. Okay, let me go try again. There we go, slightly more focused um, analysis of, of just the optic tectum. And then again, this was work from the like Abitan in the lab. So this is looking at um, the um, a layer of the optic tectum. So the optic tectum is the main visual processing center in the zebrafish, so it's homologous to the superior colliculus in mammals. And um, this is um, where most of the action happens in, in terms of visual processing, at least in terms of, of prey capture. Now, what we did in this paper was look at how um, patterns of spontaneous activity change over development. So I'm not gonna go through the details of that, but I want to draw your attention to some interesting features of this, which is that um, they're very clearly um, neural assemblies in. Um, which are occurring. So groups of neurons that tend to fire together. Now I should explain this movie is speeded up 15 times. So um, um, it may appear that there's sort of spatial structure which travels along the tectum, but actually if you look at it at normal speed, you see there's just individual groups of neurons which are uh, tend to fire together. And every now and again, two groups of neurons uh, fire um, such that it looks like there's a, there's a, there's a wave of activity. So, one interesting computational challenge is, I mean, th this paper was mostly about um, um, the properties of these assemblies and how they change over development and how they're affected by um, visual experience. Um, I'm not going to talk about the details, but from a computational point of view, one of the interesting questions was um, how you should best go about detecting groups of neurons which are firing together. So that was a challenge taken on by uh, my student, Jan Malta. And one of the things we, we realized was that there's, you know, there's a lot of algorithms out there which you could use for detecting um, neural assemblies in calcium imaging data. So this is, uh, this is a, a few of them. So uh, for instance, independent composite analysis, um, this is a Promax rotation um, followed um, um, by um, threshold of using a market Marchenko Pasteur distribution. Um, it's an algorithm from R Rafa Euster and, and colleagues, a uh, singular value competition, um, decomposition, a frequent item set mining approach. Um, what Jan did was he um, um, adapted a an algorithm recently proposed by um, um, Reinhardt and Newman, um, which he's called um, um, similarity graph clustering here. And so what we did was we took this algorithm and we compared it using simulated data with a lot of these um, other algorithms. So using, because the problem here is you, you don't, you, there's no ground truth available to you. You don't know what's really there. All you know is what, what you see in these, um, in these movies. And so um, in order to decide whether an algorithm is working well or not, um, one of the best things you can do is generate artificial data, which looks like the real data, and then um, determine how well algorithms are able to recover the structure that you know is in that simulated data because you put it there in the first place. And what Jan found was this, this algorithm is actually um, essentially the, um, um, the best approach. And what it does is it actually clusters in frame space. So you take the individual frames for the movie and you have a, a similarity metric between those frames. Then you group together frames which are similar and then you cluster those frames 
and it's the and then average them to um, average them together uh, within a cluster, and uh, it's that tells you the the assemblage. So it turns out that that um, um, works very well. Okay, another question you could ask about these assemblies is how might they form? I mean, is it possible they form by um, sort of a standard unsupervised learning process? Now, one of the interesting things is that um, although there are retinal wa waves in, in zebrafish, um, you still get the same patterns of, or very similar patterns of spontaneous activity in the tectum, even when um, even when you remove the eyes early early on. So without any visual input during the development of the tectum, you still get these, um, um, uh, neural assemblies spontaneously forming. And so my student Marcus Tripleton um, in the lab, who's now a postdoc with Liam Panitsky at Columbia University, um, what he did was um, develop a, a simple model based on a population of excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurons. We assumed a um, very simple activation rule. So um, this is the activation of the excitatory pool and the inhibitory pool. This is just a thresholding function. You're just adding up some weighted input of the other, other inputs, and then you have some, um, some, some noise. And then we assumed a simple um, Hebbian type learning rule with some, 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 some pre and prosynaptic normalization. And so we ran this model and we asked whether it would form um, these kinds of um, neural assemblies. And what we found um, was that um, indeed it does. So this is um, a weight matrix of um, 100 um, uh, neurons here. And um, so each neuron fires, has got a small probability of firing randomly by itself. So if you look at the raster plot, um, initially um, you just, just see random activity on these, in all these neurons. However, when you run that learning rule, you find that um, you now get um, uh, groups of neurons that tend to fire together. So you see these vertical lines grouping neurons in the raster plot, and the weight matrix here shows you, um, it's ordered to show up these clusters, and so you see the, you get these structures of um, clusters of strong connections in, in the weight matrix. Now, interestingly, um, and this is a, a similar number of assemblies that we, we found in our data. Interestingly, the uh, structure of these assemblies gradually evolves in time. So if we look at the autosimilarity of these assemblies over time, so this is simulated time um, over this, and so we, you know, we simulated time over a similar, similar period of time that we're looking at zebrafish development, and we saw that there was a um, gradual um, uh, decay. So the assembly, the number of assemblies remains relatively constant, but their structure is constantly rearranging. So this is a very interesting um, uh, prediction from the model, which we haven't been able to test so far. Um, experimentally, because we can only really keep the recording stable for a, a couple of hours at a time, and we can't record for uh, for days at least. Um, if there's time, I'll show you some some new technology later, um, which would help us address this question. Okay, so um, so far this is just looking at spontaneous activity, but of course one of the key questions here is what's happening to um, um, evoked activity over development. So now what we've got is we've got the fish embedded in agarose. Um, we're imaging it with a two-photon microscope, and it's looking at um, the side of the dish here where pre we're presenting spots. So you can see um, from this webcam image here, you can see us presenting small spots onto the side of the dish. So this is sort of the outside of the dish, and so the fish is seeing seeing these spots on the inside here. And um, so these these spots look rather like prey to the fish. So they're similar size, about six degrees to the size of paramecia when uh, zebrafish start to get interested in them. And so you can see the, the presentation of these spots produces um, um, clusters of neurons firing in the, in the tectum. And um, if we plot this as a function of distance, you see this beautiful um, uh, topographic map across the tectum here. So we were interested in how this map changes over development and whether that, that might have anything to do with differences in uh, changes in hunting performance over development. So one of the first thing which we found was that there was this, um, at least at the particular depth we were looking at in the tectum, there was this bias in the amplitude. So this is just looking at the raw amplitude of the delta F over F responses, the calcium responses. So at 15 days, you see this fairly smooth response across the, the tectum. However, early on, there is a very strong bias, much stronger responses in the um, parts of the tectum which represent the um, rear visual field. So zero degrees corresponds to directly in front of the fish and 180 is behind the fish. So initially, you actually get much larger responses to stimuli behind the fish. And if you plot the receptive field positions of the neurons in the tectum, 
um, and look at the, the number of um, receptive fields which represent um, particular positions in the visual field. You can plot the cumulative probability of those. And so, it, so at 15 days, you see this reasonably uh, straight line here, meaning that um, roughly speaking, that all stimuli are evenly represented in the tectum. However, early on, you see that there's a very strong bias towards uh, stimuli in the rear visual field. So, um, um, so this is developmental gradient in the structure of the map. And possibly what's going on here is that the fish is initially most interested in predators sneaking up behind it. And so that's why you get the largest responses in the rear visual field. But then it becomes more interested in catching prey in front of it. And that's um, why things then even out. So we looked at decoding. So um, based on the linear decoder, how accurately could we um, decode which spot was being presented and how that changed over development. And you see um, the decoding improves over development. Um, so this is interesting because the hunting is also improving over development. And um, interestingly, that improvement in decoding performance is mostly in the frontal visual field here, so um, less than 90 degrees. So there's actually not much change in the rear visual field. Uh, but this improvement you can see here is all due to um, uh, dramatic improvements in decoding performance in the frontal visual field. So. Um, during the time that the fish are getting better at hunting prey, they're also, um, we can actually decode the position of stimuli better from the frontal visual field. We also looked at um, um, the uh, mutual information between the stimuli and responses. And so this is looking at um, frontal, middle and rear stimuli at these different agents. And so for, a, for early on in development, you have uh, much more um, information about rear stimuli than frontal stimuli, but by 15 days post fertilization, that is evened out. Now, we were interested, so we saw this correlation between decoding and um, hunting, um, so improvements in decoding and improvements in hunting. But we asked, could you actually do this on the level of individual fish? Now, of course, everything's improving over development. So um, what we did was we picked one age, this is 5 DPF, where there was quite a range of um, hit ratios and decoding performances. And we simply plotted um, these against each other. So in the experiment, what we do is we um, put the fish in a dish and measure it hunting uh, paramecia for a while, um, which allows us to calculate a hit ratio. Then we put that same fish under the microscope and we um, uh, look present spots and we look at how um, good the textual representation of those spots is in terms of um, how accurately we can decode which spot is being presented. And so what we see from that is that we actually have a correlation there. So in other words, you could say that from the, um, the quality of the tectal code, we could actually predict how good the fish is at hunting prey. Now there's a, a slight nuance here, which I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip, skip over. Um, so I just wanna mention a new project um, uh, which is being led by uh, my postdoc Iris Zoo in the lab. And so I mentioned early on that um, um, that a lot of uh, neural disorders are actually disorders of neural development. And one of those is autism. Now, the most common inherited form of autism is um, fragile X syndrome, which is caused by a mutation in the gene FMR1. So we've got fish which are mutant for this gene. And we ran them through the same pipeline, or we we're in the process of doing that, running through the same pipeline and asking whether this affects their, um, their visual processing abilities as measured by their hunting performance and also their um, uh, tectal codes as uh, measured by their decoder performance. So you can see here that there actually appears to be a developmental delay um, in the fragile X fish. So this is the homozygote, the minus minus case, and this is the heterozygote. So the homozygote compared to the heterozygote has lower decoder performance at five days post-fertilization, but um, catches up at um, um, later, uh, later ages. We also find that there's a, um, a slowdown in the development of the map. So this is the five-day homozygote case, which is far behind the other cases. Um, by nine days, the homozygote case has nicely caught up, but earlier on, when I say far behind, what I mean is in terms of this bias towards rear visual field. So using this uh, shape of this curve as a, as, as a measure of how developed the system is, uh, the fragile X fish seem to be less developed early on. Um, 
And Iris has also done some very nice um, social behavior assays. So uh, zebrafish start to develop um, social behaviors about uh, three weeks of age. And um, so one way you can measure that is by uh, putting two fish in a dish, but separating them by a piece of glass so they can see each other, but they can't get to each other. And what they like to do is um, uh, sort of look at each other and, and uh, copy each other's movements. Um, and so if you look at the time delay it takes for the fish to copy the other fish's movement. So here we have uh, a wild type fish and a homozygote fragile X fish. This is a 28 days post fertilization um, So the wild type fish, um, you know, they have a mean lag of about 250 milliseconds um, to uh, respond to the movements of the other fish. But the fragile X fish actually have a longer delay. So even though according to these metrics here, by, by um, 13 days, they've caught up on these metrics. There's clearly a long lasting change in that in terms of their social behavior, um, they're taking longer to respond to these social cues. So that's um, a project that's still ongoing. Okay, so I'm almost out of time. So just briefly, I want to mention um, um, some more work from Marcus Triplett in, in the lab. And what he's done is um, taken the data from some of these um, evoked activity experiments and looked at um, how we can analyze those in terms of the interplay between evoked and spontaneous activity. So these are some of the um, raw delta F over F traces from the kind of experiment where I showed you the movie before where we present spots and we're recording activity. So, so for instance, for this neuron, they're clearly, uh, this neuron is clearly responding to particular stimuli. So these vertical lines are the stimuli being presented, the different colors correspond to different positions in the visual field. And so you can see the neuron you know, responds to some of these stimuli, but it also has spontaneous activity. So you can see there's this, um, a peak of activity here, which is does not correspond to when a stimulus was presented. And so um, interestingly, that peak is correlated with a peak in activity in other neurons. So there seems to be shared variability, shared um, spontaneous activity between these neurons. And so Marcus asked if we could separate those using a statistical model. So he developed this model called, we called a calcium imaging latent variable analysis or, or SILVA. So it's currently under review. There's a, there's a preprint here. And the idea here is that we're combining, um, so we have sensory stimuli and um, these unknown latent factors. So these hidden variables, which are controlling spontaneous activity, and they're combined linearly with these unknown weights. And um, so by convolving those with a suitable calcium kernel, we're trying to explain this fluorescence data. So using some, some, um, um, some machine learning, um, Marcus was able to um, um, get the model to learn um, to produce these fluorescence traces. And because of the linearity of this model here, we can then decompose the trained model into um, the parts which the model thinks are evoked responses and the part which it thinks is shared spontaneous activity. So this is the same trace as we saw before, but now we have separated them out according to the model in terms of what the model thinks is um, evoked activity that's in red, or what the model thinks which is spontaneous activity that's in blue. And so if you look here, you see that it's explained this event mostly in terms of red here. So black is the raw delta S over S trace, and the red and the blue are the um, two components of that, which the model has attributed to evoked in red and spontaneous in blue. And so it's attributed this mostly to evoked activity, but this event here is attributed entirely to spontaneous activity, so it's in blue. So even though there's a lot of activity at the time this um, stimulus is being presented here, the model has correctly uh, decided that this is actually just spontaneous activity comes, coming from this event here. And it's done the same for um, these other neurons. And so you see this red line is just flat for these neurons. So the model um, has, has figured out that it shouldn't, you shouldn't be thinking of this as um, evoked activity, even though there's quite a lot of calcium activity here. And um, so you can um, sort, um, you can, so here we, um, we assume there are three latent factors. And so these factors are actually quite distinct. So this is the coupling of the neurons to the factors. And there isn't much overlap um, in coupling of neurons to factors, even though that's not an assumption of the model. And um, so this is how these factors are laid out across the tectum here. So this is the spatial position of cells in the tectum, colored according to the three factors that the model has assigned them to. And you see they're quite nicely spatially localized. 
Okay, so almost done. So uh, my last um, data slide. So uh, this is a new collaboration with Tai Trong and David Prober at Caltech. And so we started to look at sleep in zebrafish. So Tai has developed this very nice um, two photon uh, light sheet imaging um, system, which allows you to make 24 hour recordings of zebrafish whole brain activity. And so you can look at um, whole brain activity over the entire day night cycle and ask really interesting questions about what's regulating uh, sleep because you can see, you know, you basically have single neuron resolution, you can see every single neuron in the brain. And so um, you can, you have access to questions about, um, you know, answering questions about sleep that we really haven't had before. So I'm uh, working on them on aspects of the data analysis and, and, and modeling. So this is a, a, a picture from a grant we just um, submitted. Um, but I'm just sort of uh, advertising this as some of the work we'll be continuing to do um, in the future if there's anybody who's interested in any of those positions when I move to uh, WashU. Okay, to summarize. So we've been working with the zebrafish, trying to understand um, the computations involving involved in neural development. And the hope is that that will help inspire new developments in artificial intelligence um, and um, and also help us understand um, neural disorders. So uh, watch out. So I'd like to thank um, all the many people in the lab who contributed to this work. I've mentioned some of them already. Here's the um, complete list for all the work I've shown so far. Um, uh, my, my collaborators, um, I mentioned Peter Diane and Linda Richards was also a collaborator on the um, Axon Guidance work and Ethan Scott on some of the um, uh, Zebrafish work and Jeff Verbach on um, uh, developing some of the Axon Guidance assays. And of course, thank you very much to all the funding sources. So. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take some questions now. And of course, there'll be a much longer question session later. Thank you. OK, Joe, thank you very much. It was a very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, we don't have much time for questions, maybe one or most two. But uh, as you say, I recall the attendees that we have this uh, question and answer session in, in five hours at 1 PM European time. But let, let's, uh, let's go to the, to the questions and, and try to invite uh, Thomas Novotny to, to, to ask his question. Let's see if it works. Thomas? Well, I, I yeah, mean- Yeah, there's always oh, okay. a little delay, right, to, to set. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no I had worries. a question uh, going quite back now uh, to the earlier parts of the talk with the uh, receptor work where you had the subunit model with the hidden Markov mm. uh, chain. And um, there were six hidden states there where it's not activated. And I was wondering whether there was some intuitive understanding why it needs to be so many. Right, so what, what Brendan did was um, we, we built up through a series of models of increasing complexity. And um, so he took a very systematic approach where he tried simpler models um, to start with and basically tried, you know, the minimum number of states. Um, and what he found was that that architecture was the simplest he could come up with um, to, to explain, um, just quantitatively explain all the nuances of the, uh, of, of the real data. Right. So what? what yeah. yeah go on. So it's it's simply just a kind of um, goodness of fit. Something was collapsing to something acceptable at six states. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, Brendan could probably give you a better um, uh, uh, a better explanation, but I think that's the best I can do at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think we have time for a second question. Oh, sorry. Um, I will invite this the second question. Let's see if it works now. Uh, let me see if I can work with the second person. Hmm. Should we come in? Well, if not, if I can read it for you, Jeff. Sure. Uh, he say, how exhaustively are the biochemical pathway regulated axon guidance mapped out? How realistic is a quantitative simulation of axon guidance starting from individual pathway? And how much can we expect this to change in the next 10 years? 
Right. So that's a very interesting question. So there's been, I mean, that's been one of the main um, focuses of, 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 of the um, axon guidance field in general, trying to unravel these signaling pathways. And I mean, there's certainly been a lot of progress with that. However, um, in common with a lot of work on signaling pathways in general, it's very hard to be very quantitative about it because, you know, you've got all these molecules interaction interacting and we know very little about the you know the quantitative parameters of those interactions like the rate constants and, and so on so um, our goal so our goal with the work I showed with the the signaling pathways to understand attraction versus is repulsion our goal was you know very focused there and um, you know we had sort of a, a complicated signaling um, pathway but we had a very simple model of how that was integrated across the growth cone, basically just sort of two copies of that pathway, which took different levels of calcium input on the two sides of the growth cone. Um, to, to, and and yeah, the output was just binary. We, we, we weren't, I mean, the output was just um, left or right. We weren't trying to explain any more subtle features of the growth cone's uh, response. I think it will be very difficult to, um, to we, we, with current knowledge to, develop a model that wasn't very, very speculative. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I'm sure the situation will improve over the next 10 years, but I'm not optimistic it will improve that much because mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's very hard work to really pin down all these quantitative parameters you need for a, a fully constrained model of these complex um, you know, signaling networks. And there really isn't much incentive for people to, um, um, to do that. Because um, those are not the kind of questions that most biologists uh, are interested in. Well, okay, Geoff, I think we are in time now. Thank you very much for the presentation again, and thank everybody for being here. And we see in five hours. Eh? We see back here in five hours. Thank yes. you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.